enormous pleasure to be able to introduce um, Peter Hennessy, who since 1992 has been the Acting Professor of Contemporary British History at Queen Mary College. Um, Peter is quite simply the preeminent figure in contemporary British political history, no doubt about it. Um, before taking up uh, his academic career, um, Peter was uh, a distinguished journalist on the Times, Financial Times, uh, the Lobby of Westminster Times. <coughs> he is the author of a series of, book, of, of books that, for anyone interested uh, in British political history, will be standard works of rest, reference. Cabinet, Whitehall, uh, moving on to the, the hidden wiring and earthing the British Constitution, and some extraordinarily vivid and lively works of contemporary history, um, like Never Again and Having It So Good, written in the 50s. And of course, um, last year, Peter was appointed uh, a crossbench peer, taking the title of Brown Hennessy of Nimsfield. Is that what you say? Thank you. So, Peter, give me a good Thank you, Chris. <coughs> Thank you for that fine introduction with those seven themes. It's a great pleasure and an honour to be here. Every time David and Michael ask me to do something, I, my heart gives a little skip. And not just because of the uh, pleasures of living history that you represent, but also, I, I mean what I say, you're courteous, well-dressed, you turn up on time, so unlike the average undergraduate <laughs> in these days. It's funny going to treat to see you as always. Um, and apologies because I've got to dash off this afternoon to, to hear President Obama, and I'll try and come back to the drinks. I would like to have been here all day. This question has intrigued me for a long time. For two reasons. One is I think it's the great residual question for we historians that runs through the post-war period, the Westminster model and its applicability. And I've always been struck as a Whitehall watcher by, until very recently, the reluctance of those in Whitehall to contemplate even the beginnings of a written constitution for us in the UK. But at the same time, they haven't got the slightest hesitation for writing about 40 for other people. <laughs> and only since the end of empire we began to catch up in a funny way. We're still pretending we're not. We have lots of constitutional statutes, new ones now, devolution ones, human rights act, freedom of information. We have the Constitutional Governance and Reform Act 2010, which is terribly significant, though hardly anyone has noticed it. And we have lots of codes. We have ministerial codes, we have civil service codes, we have codes for special advisors. So the British Constitution has moved from the back of an envelope to the front of a code, to the face of a bill, in many cases. But in the period we're looking at today, the last thing Whitehall wanted to do was to write down the Constitution for us. But you became dab hands of doing it for other people. And I think it's my friend Colin Seymour Yaw who noticed that in each generation that had to produce a new Constitution, the Colonial Office and the Commonwealth Relations Office would incorporate what they thought was the latest version of best practice in the UK. <laughs> So in a funny way, it's, it's, a, it's a very useful way of looking at the um, overseas constitutions to see what was thought to be the best and most recent update of the way we Brits and, by extension, the former territorial empire should do it. So it's a question full of intrigue and interest. And I'm sure when we get to, not just the presentations, but the questions, we're going to shut the subject on quite a bit. Um, just before we get to, when we get to question time, if for the sake of just to reiterate what Philip was saying for the cameras and the recording, if you could identify yourself before you speak. But to kick us off, we have Christopher Copper on the Solomon Islands. Thank you very much. I'll sit down if you don't mind, because uh, I can't stand too well. Let me take you into the Western Pacific, the Southwest Pacific, the pattern of islands, a chain of islands off the northeast coast of Australia. <coughs> Papua New Guinea, Solomons, Vanuatu, known as New Hebrides, Caledonia, and Fiji. Islands of all shapes, sizes, and types. Huge islands, tiny islands, jungle clad, lagoons, even artificial islands. The great thing about these islands, they're all racially the same. They're all Melanesian. But they're all very, very different Melanesian. And this is one of the keys to constitutional and political development of the Solomons. The important thing to understand is, is 
They're very divided. They're divided by geography. Miles and miles of ocean. I put a chart stuck on that wall, sadly, because they kept falling off this one. But it just goes on forever. So if you're a touring officer and administrator, <coughs> difficult. Separation by sea. Separation on island. You find <coughs> tiny villages in those tough jungle areas. And then you find settlements on the coast. All with their local different cultures. And all refusing to accept the other's cultures. Languages, 60 different languages and more. Remember, all Melanesia. Rivalries between the coast people, the saltwater people, and the bush people. Intense rivalries. Rebellion loyalties, divided loyalties. <coughs> Soon after the war, there was a major rebellion in the Solomons. Probably many of you have never heard of it. But it caused divided loyalties. Those who stayed loyal to the administration and those who were against it. <coughs> Different education levels. The missions brought great benefits, but it brought different education standards from one set of islands to the other. Christian religion, every single branch of Christian religion was represented, and they didn't get on, so it brought division, it brought strife. And then the raiding and the fighting, the suspicions and that came from that. Still going on in Papua New Guinea today, but died out in the Solomons. Sporting differences. They wouldn't allow another islander of another group to referee them. So they had to have outsiders in to do it. In the public service, or even business, would not allow to take orders from anybody other than from their own clan. A major division. So it's all very well saying we're all unified, producing unitary this and a federal that. They couldn't agree. Impossible to run. The unifiers were that they were all Melanesians and they had this great, <coughs> great Melanesian way culture. We'll do it the Melanesian way. Endless discussion. Morning, noon and night. Pipe smoking. But by goodness, it produced a unified, agreed decision. It's called Melanesian way of government. They're all traditions, very little writing. It's storytelling going back years and years and years. Their adherence to land ownership and their rules of land ownership and use. Can you imagine those rules conflicting with the outsider's views? We said it's good for you to mine that, good for you to fish that, good for you to agriculture that. They would say, ah. Uh -uh. No. And that caused considerable difficulty for the colonial administration. Pigeon English was a great unifier. Because of the slave trade, they all ended up in these plantations and they couldn't understand each other. So they created Pigeon English. Great. And then their hostility to outsiders. This came from blackbirding, slave trade, land grabbers. And there was great unity from the war record. They were very pleased about their war record. Now that's the background. Anthropologist's dream, absolutely. The administrator and the government, nightmare. Some government and politics colonized at the end of the 19th century. For strategic reasons, to keep the Americans and the French and the Germans out, but also to stop a very significant thing that not many people know about, the dreadful slave trading that was going on into the plantations of Fiji and Australia, whose legacy lives on today. Between the world wars, nothing much, bit of tax collecting, and the war and all of the usual things. And then Armageddon. You've never seen anything like it. Eyewitness just sat there and watched as the Allies and the Japanese slugged it out toe to toe. Air battles overhead, the naval battles. You've never seen anything like it. Land armies slaughtering each other. <coughs> and what was very interesting is that my relatives said to me, you Europeans couldn't make your minds up at all. Because one minute you're telling us not to kill each other and be peaceful and behave, and the next minute <laughs> is to go and kill every Japanese you can conceive. 
Now, this did have an important effect on the mind of the Islanders. It showed them the outside world, it showed the way of government, and it showed them that there were things to be earned by contact with the outside world. Now, getting out. Well, this was triggered by the war, the marching rule rebellion, the Macmillan wind of change, and then London, happened to do, asked the Solomons, I swear, can the Solomons be made independent, and if so, when? And the Solomons, Tom Russell was in that group, replied, yes, 1977. And that forecast was made in 1962. The race was on, the standard four steps over 18 years, a council, appointed council, a legislative council that was appointed, an elected uh, legislative council, then the famous culture constitution, and then back to the ministerial system, quickly into self-government, ministerial system and independence. And the final constitution is behind me, kind of stuck on the wall, which was a poster produced at the time. And I brought a few visuals here one or two leaflets that were introduced on elections and what have you. Now, the interesting thing is, is the cultural constitution was made and done to fit them. And I'm going to tell you why it didn't work in a minute. Now, I thought the only way I could answer the question you put in the correspondence you wrote, you just put it in the introduction, was actually to ask a senior big man Solomon Ardena we happened to be in Europe with the European community last week. And I put my paper to him. And he said, quick as a flash, the Westminster system worked for us. It unified us. It was the only system that did, as did the legal and judicial system. And thank God for that. We made it work without parties, because parties because of our divisions, no party within a party could agree on what its policies were. So party politics just did not work. So they made it work without party politics. It worked well for them because it fitted their ceremonials, their protocols, their rules, their traditions, their chief reforms. Very important in the Pacific. And finally, they couldn't agree on a better replacement, although there were one or two attempts. And the cultural constitution failed because it divided them. They just could not agree amongst themselves what their system of government was going to do. They couldn't agree any policies. So it just didn't work. And there was something else he said. Devolution, which you can see behind these provincial assemblies, which went on at the same time, which was very much the fashion. The professor here mentioned Federal systems and unitary systems. Constitutional law is love it. But my big man said in Europe to me, tell me, absolutely, devolution killed us. We collapsed into state failure because of it. Because down at provincial level, because of the divisions, we couldn't agree any policies. A bit of agriculture here, a bit of fishing here. It just did not work. We had to then, and this will be new to all of you, our own system to make it work. Because central government's policies were not getting through. The provincial policies were not getting through. And my wife's relatives weren't getting health, agriculture extension, fisheries, all the basic services. So they really were going back to where before it all started. <coughs> so what they did was this. The members of parliament, all 50 of them were each granted annually $3 million by the Ministry of Home Affairs into their bank account, great trust needed here, and they were seconded three officials, a clerk, administrator, a bookkeeper, an accountant, and a planner. And the Member of Parliament functioned as the District Commissioner and as an MP. And his officials functioned as a sort of district officers. So they went to their constituencies, set up these little mini offices, and they asked their constituencies, what do you want? The constituents said this. They then drew up a list with them. And then they ordered the stuff, got it sent out, mm -hmm. and got 
services delivered. They've now got water systems, water tanks, toilets, solar heating. He said to me his constituency is lit up at night from solar power. And provincial assemblies are irrelevant. And what we want to do is get back those constitutional advisors who gave us that, Professor Yashgai and others from the FCO, to formalise this, because it works. And we don't want any lengthy dissertations, we don't want any focus and concentrations on detail. Keep it simple. That's it. And that's where we are now. They've made it work. Now I brought with me a, a paper with the background details to what I've told you about here. Take a copy if you want. And I brought a few visuals just to give you a taster. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christopher. It's very Follow on very neatly, given the overlap of experience, is Tom Russell, who served in the Solomon Islands for 26 years from 1948 to 74. Latterly as Financial Secretary and then Chief Secretary of the Pacific High Commission. And as Governor of the Cayman Islands, a story of in that, from 74 to 82. And was the Cayman Islands government representative of the UK, <coughs> serving in London from 1982 to 2000. Tom, the Thank you, sir. <coughs> I have entitled my paper, The Route to Self-Government, The Pros and Cons of the Westminster System. And I'll be uh, looking at this uh, topic from the point of view of uh, the Southern Islands, which became independent in 1978, four years after I left, and the Cayman Islands, which is one of the ten remaining British overseas territories. <coughs> And while we'll be looking at that discussion today from a historic perspective, the, our findings and, and, and the results of our discussion may be very pertinent <coughs> to these ten territories which still remain. Now, as has been mentioned, in 1970, uh, the Solomons departed from the ministerial system and uh, followed the Donamore Constitution, which had been adopted for so long, recommended <coughs> by Lord Donamore. And that set up, got away from the ministerial system, set up a series of committees. <coughs> our court from uh, our, our select committee report, the existing 1970 Constitution, with a single council with legislative and executive functions, and embracing a series of committees with executive powers was seen at the time as reflecting to some extent Melanesian customs by which a proposition had been, been considered by a small number of people, analogous to a committee, was then mulled over and decisions were taken by a larger group analogous to a single council. Now this uh, Dunmore constitution had been proposed in the 1960s also for St. Helena, the Seychelles, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. But how are you going to convert an amorphous local practice into the strict confines of a constitution? Well, it came up in 1970 with a uh, council of 17 elected members, of whom five were appointed as chairman of committees analogous to ministries, social services, internal affairs, natural resources, communications and works, and commerce and industry. Though the three official members were also members of the assembly, the usual three, the Attorney General, the Financial Secretary, and the Chief Secretary. And there was room to appoint up to six public service members if the High Commissioner, in his discretion, decided that that would enhance the proceedings. <clears throat> now that was buttressed by a finance committee with the financial secretary as a chairman, the five chairman of committees as members, the other two um, official members, the Attorney General and the Chief Secretary, and a few uh, appointed members, if the, if the High Commissioner appointed other members into the 
And the Governor Council met in private as an executive and in public as a parliament making the laws. It's a bold experiment, the Melanies and politicians saying, let's do it my way. And where did it fall down? Well, in 1972, that's only two years after it came in, I was chairman of a select committee to decide where the next constitutional stage should take us. John Smith, who had introduced the day, was a member of that committee as financial secretary. We found that the system was neither cheap nor effective. We to carry in members for council and committee meetings from outer, outer islands that uh, Mr. Cochrane had been describing. If a ship was available, we didn't have aircraft in these early days. We found that the chairmen were learning politics fast, but it was not training for leadership because they deferred the decisions to the next meeting of the council or the, or the <coughs> committee. It was not really a substitute for cabinet but government. It delayed decision making because the, 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 delay, the chairman delay until the next, next meeting. And <clears throat> there was lots of duplication of discussion and papers being discussed in three committees, uh, two committees in one council. Uh, <clears throat> the, the thing was that the, the committees had no legislative power so that if they wanted a simple piece of legislation on fence and cattle, it had to be the, the debated committee, the fair, the governing council a meeting in private, the governing council meeting in public. So we, and I, I should mention perhaps two other factors that uh, came out which were not mentioned in the committee. One was that, um, Fiji had become independent in 1970. Papua New Guinea was coming up in 1975. And the politicians felt that a return to orthodoxy would speed us into independence. And the second reason was that when, when they traveled abroad and said, I'm a chairman of committees, it cut no ice whatsoever. <laughs> they didn't get the, the greeter and the VIP lounge at Heathrow and the hotels didn't pay very much attention. That, that, believe it or not, was a uh, consideration. Now let me turn now to the Cayman Islands, a completely different picture. In 1962, it had been, Cayman Islands had been literally administered as a parish of Jamaica. And they thought that when Jamaica became independent, it would be a colony of England than a colony of Jamaica. So we ended up with a traditional legislative assembly with 14 elected members, uh, the three traditional official members, an executive council composed of four elected members um, who had semi-ministerial powers, and the three official members. The governor presided over both the executive council and there also was the presiding officer in the Legislative Assembly. There's provision in the Constitution for them to vote a speaker, but for the seven and a half years I was there, I was told to carry on firing. So they gave a, a tremendous rapport with backbenchers, which otherwise I would not have had. Now, what are the pros and cons of the Westminster system as, as I saw it then? First of all, you inherited a very well established system. Clerk of the House of Commons would help you to draft your uh, standing orders for the Legislative Assembly. And uh, make, as far as, as uh, allowed under the present Constitution, there might be slight variations in, in parliamentary procedure. Members could join the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and go to um, conferences of that, that body, which gave them a certain exposure to parliamentary tactics. 
the executive council was um, the standing orders for that were based on on the cabinet model, where you have the principal collective responsibility, secrecy of cabinet papers, um, and above all, liaison between portfolios before papers came before cabinet. Very important, particularly with cabinet. You had the Independent Judiciary and the Public Service Commission, as been mentioned earlier. And generally speaking, it was a, a system that was known and uh, you had backup if you got into problems in, in, locally, you could come back to London and say, how do we get to this path, this, this problem? Now, against the Westminster system and in, in the Cayman Islands, as I saw it, you were adapting a, a parliament of more than 600 members to one with about 20 or 14. You've got standing committees in, in the parliament. You have your, your uh, business committee, your finance committee, your house committee. There'll be a number of standing committees that are appointed during the life of parliament. These have all got to be stuffed, and it means that uh, you've got small numbers of people who somehow don't turn up always. The committee can't proceed because it hasn't got a quorum. And uh, in the legislative assembly, both the opposition and and the uh, and, and the government will play the numbers game. And if you have two or three members missing, it can determine whether a bill goes through or it doesn't go through. Another point was that whereas we had um, standing orders for the Legislative Assembly, once members were in the Assembly, uh, it was Erskine May that, that took over and the Constitution to some extent was set aside once the parliamentarians were inside that government. Again, the Westminster system is buttressed by a very effective local government system throughout this country. And the Cayman Islands would no local government at all. Uh, recently, we've had advisory committees advising the, the representatives for that constituency. Parliamentarians don't like this because they feel that they are not going to get the credit for anything that takes place in that constituency. It would be the local government that would uh, get the kudos. The UK has no written constitution, but changes in procedure don't somehow affect the fabric of the, of the constitution. Uh, with a written constitution, uh, that is not the case. And uh, the point was made uh, in the introductory talk um, about the was it independence co uh, the constitutions are, are taking place at roughly four four yearly intervals leading up to independence. And when we uh, arrive at the independence constitution that seems to be the end of the matter. But if the, co the local politicians are used to these steps step by step, the independent constitution may be simply seen as another step towards the ideal constitution for that territory. And as we've seen uh, with the Solomon Island president, do it my way does not always give you the full, the best results. The other the final point I would like to make is that um, I've told, mentioned the importance of local government. Can the, can, the, can the Westminster system work without an effective local government system? Uh, and secondly, political parties in this country are built up by parties, groups of people having different ideological approach to government. In a small territory, your parties are grouped around uh, uh, parliamentarians with strong leadership qualities. 
and uh, inducements can be put in, in the way. Come on board and, and I'll give you a ministry. Money may pass. Crossing the floor is, is quite common during the life of a parliament and governments can fall with votes of no confidence simply because somebody's been induced to move from one party to another. And you haven't got the discipline, as we have in this country, of the, the ideological approach to the party we make. That's it. Thank you, Tom, very much. Thank you. Now we have Simon Gillette on Nauru and St. Helena. Simon was Chief Secretary of Nauru 75-77 and the Administrator of Ascension, the Treasurer of Development Secretary of St. Helena in 1977 and 1982. Were you on Ascension and the build up to 44? No, no. Oh, you well, before. well before, yes, I've been in my day job. Yes. Um, I called my paper of which there's only one copy on the um, Perspectives from Nauru and St. Helena, and very briefly for those who don't know about Nauru, it's, it's 400 miles from the nearest land uh, in the shape of Kiribati to build domes. I think it's 800 miles from the Solomons. So by even the Solomons standards, it's isolated. It's 10, 10, 10 kilometers in circumference and is simply a big phosphate mine, or was, until the phosphate ran out, which was in 98. I was there in, in 1975 to 77. The then president was the founder of the nation, Amadorov, who I can only describe as Churchillian. I've met a number of important people and distinguished people, but he is the only great man on nothing would stop him. And he made Nauru independent. The, the Australians who administered it under a, what was originally a, um, a Class C mandate in the League of Nations awarded to King George V, King Emperor and so on, on behalf of the UK and New Zealand, who also shares in the phosphate. Um, really were driven into granting complete independence for an island of 6,000 people at most. And St. Lena is similarly small. Um, and the first point I want to make is that the question of scale is above all relevant to the appropriateness of the, of the Westminster model. On that scale, I mean 6,000, 5,000 people, St. Lena is now down to 4,000. Extreme isolation. Everybody knows everybody else. Anyway, 4,000 human beings is only 2,000 adults. You might as well have a sort of Athenian bude, whatever it's called, where everybody comes to the assembly and don't bother with representatives. Anyway, what Nauru had was a local government which had been set up, I think, in the 20s by the Australian administrators and was manned by, originally by, what they call the traditional ruler or chief, but after the Second World War, by new men like Hamada Roberts, who had been educated, there was all plenty of money for education from the phosphate revenues in Australia to A-level standard in, in modern terms. And Hamada Roberts wasn't the only well-educated man, and of course the younger generation of ministers, people in their 30s, had been to university as well. Um, but the local government continued to exist after independence when a parliament was created. Eighteen members made very small constituencies. I was chief returning officer and there was compulsory voting on the Australian model. It worked, like not work. The cabinet was six. They were all, including the president, and they were all in the parliament. So there wasn't much difficulty in running the place. There was plenty of money, and Hamid Robert was the recognized leader. But they began to get tired of him on a generational basis. He became increasingly autocratic. And uh, there was a general election, and he lost. And uh, he was completely gobsmacked. Couldn't believe it. And proceeded to regain his position 
by um, gerrymandering and fill a filibustering in the small parliament. He was very much better at it than the younger generation, and they were unable to pass any legislation. And two years later, he was back in office <coughs> until he died in 89. And since then, a number of lesser figures have, have boxed and coxed as <coughs> president. They've run out of money, and I'm not really in touch with the situation. So that's Nauru, isolated, very wealthy, and over-governed, if anything. And the Westminster model simply took no account of certain very important things, like when was a particular elector, citizen, going to get a, his payout. What that meant was that the island was divided into tiny land holdings. Any one landowner would have had several. And when they were declared open for mining, of course, the owner was paid his royalty. And it made some of them very rich indeed. Now, this was so controversial a subject, everybody suspected everybody else of stating their claims, as it were, that um, the, in many ways, the most important person on the island was not the most important foreigner, was not me as head of the public service, but Laurie Stock, the Larry Stock, Lawrence Stock, the Australian government surveyor. Who, who worked out each postage stamp for the whole And he was completely trusted, had been known for, and for all I know, he's still there, but he must be very old. And he was, in many ways, the most important guardian of, of individual wealth. Um, changing the leader I've described in Nauru, of course, in St. Helena. It's done by the foreign office. They appoint a new governor. St. Helena has the constitution that Tom Russell described to the Caymans very much. There's a legislative council in the 14, and four, five of them sit on the governor's, sorry, four of them sit on the governor's executive council, and are in effect cabinet ministers. They chair functional departmental committees, there's one for agriculture and natural resources, there's a public works one, there's education, to which officials are co-opted and the key official, the education officer or the agricultural officer, runs the administration. So you effectively have a kind of um, pre-independence um, members system, such as I think was common in, in, in many African dependencies. Um, and it works very well. They know perfectly well that London calls the shots because their, their economy is, is so weak that they can't pay their way. They, they, they need a grant in aid of the ordinary budget of about 40%, and all the development aid comes from outside. Um, and unless they're going to cut the, at least the grant in aid, any further advance to independence is, is a waste of time. The financial dependence, dependency makes them, if you like, prisoners of, of, of the British Empire. Um, they're quite happy with being British. They've now got right of access to the UK for, for British citizenship. And many of them have left. Now, the only recent developments in St. Helena of which I'm aware was that I understand that instead of having councillors, 14 councillors, representing the different, in effect, parishes of the island, you may now go to any one of the 14, possibly the one who, who, who you know best who lives nearest you, if you want to make you raise an issue or make a complaint or you're not satisfied with what the government does. I'm not sure how that, that is working. But 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the then Constitution gave a great deal of, of um, freedom to representative islanders to influence the key government officials, the usual governor and chief secretary and so on, who also sat on the executive council. 
while I was in Central India, I think it was in 1979, the governor ceased to chair the Legislative Council, and that was a big improvement. An islander became Speaker, and then um, he was followed by a, a British police officer who'd been to police on the island and retired there and married the local. And he was um, Speaker for many years. And I think the passage of time and the change of attitudes with the disappearance of the colonial empires has not reduced the prestige of the government, actually not reduced his power, but it has sort of dem democratized social attitudes and they're very comfortable now with a governor who's in a, in a less superior social position, but uh, still has to do the entertaining at government house and act as a court of appeal in difficult personal issues. Um, I think I want to stress that on the local government issue, that these deep departmental committees function extremely <coughs> effectively. They're chaired by an experienced Saint Helenian who has usually been in legislative council and executive council most of his working life. It's not a full-time job, but it needs really dedicated people. These people are very influential, but if you're dissatisfied with them, there are other you can go direct to the um, British officials who hold the ring. Legal matters have become more important. When I went to St. Helena in 78, there were magistrates and there were no legal practitioners. The magistrates dealt with cases without and, and the even the government didn't have an attorney who was called the legal advisor. But they have arranged for the training of sort of para lawyers who seem to me to perform a very useful role and the judicial system is functioning well and is independent on the Westminster model of, of the legislature. Um, I think that's all right. Thank you, Simon. And the final speaker of the first session is Professor David Murray, who was constitutional advisor in the Gilbert Islands. David, the floor is yours. I couldn't, can't see people sitting down, so I, may I be allowed to stand up? Oh, David. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to address the five questions that were posed for this session. Um, I comment in relation to the Gilbert Islands colony, subsequently the Republic of Kiribati, and the relevant years with which I'm dealing are 1975 through 1979. I've distributed a sheet with basic information about the Gilbert Islands and the independence constitution. On the verso, are the five questions in the order in which I will address them. First, how effective and durable were the structures applying at independence? The constitution of the Republic of Kiribati remains in place 32 years on. There's been one amendment, and that is a minor technical one. The constitution describes and it limits. The Kiribati Constitution continues to describe the primary institutions of government, and government seems to act within the limits that are prescribed. I give two examples. Kiribati has a mixed presidential and cabinet form of government. The president is both head of state and chair of cabinet, he is elected by the national electorate, limited to three terms of four years, and removable by the legislature before the end of an ordinary term. There have been four presidents. One served for three terms in the 12 years 1979 to 1991. One was not re-elected for a second term. One lost office early in his third term 
on a vote of no confidence. The fourth completes his second term the present year. Provisions about term limits, electoral processes, terminating a presidency have all been followed. My second example, something that's unstated in the Constitution, but which inspired provisions was distrust of political parties. Provisions in the Constitution were designed to discourage parties of the sort that could be used to subvert the Constitution. The, the official Parliament website reports 30 years on, and I quote, parties are loose groupings rather than disciplined blocks with little or no structure. Members may change allegiance on a number of occasions during their tenure. It is also common for members to vote according to the special interests of their electorate on certain issues. So, success with constitutional government. Now, the question about preparation. The governor to whom I refer was the penultimate governor who served from 1973 to 1978. The first point is that the governor took clear, personal, and public responsibility for preparing the Gilbertese people. He worked energetically throughout the islands to advance awareness and understanding, understanding of independent statehood and governance. He did this without promoting any particular model of constitution. He did start from a standpoint, and I quote a dispatch, there's an opportunity to think again about the constitutional path and come up with a solution which more closely fits the environment and will stand a better chance of subsequent adjustment and survival than has always been the experience elsewhere. There were six stages to the public preparation and it was spread over three years. Stage one was engendering among those prominent in public life confidence that ordinary people were competent to fashion a constitutional framework. This was not something to be left to technical specialists. Stage two was identifying in public seminars questions that should be asked and answered in setting the framework of a constitution. This ended up as a list of 52 questions. Stage three, endorsing the questions in the House of Assembly, they were distributed widely so that across the islands attention was given to how those questions were to be understood and addressed. Stage four was a constitutional convention. In law, this was an informal advisory body assembled at the governor's invitation. 165 were present, all Gilbertese, the largest gathering from across the colony in the colony's history. From each island, came those with traditional authority, those in public office, and prominent persons in civil society. The convention met in the big public meeting house, the Maniaba, in South Tarawa, the seat of government. Each island delegation had a post, and they sat together, cross-legged on the ground, the representative of each island's elders sat with their backs to the posts, so marking their seniority and authority. Members of the public <coughs> stood or 
sat outside in the open, beyond the open-sided Maniaba. <coughs> Discussion within the Maniaba was entirely in Gilbertese. The style and techniques of traditional Gilbertese Maniaba meetings were deployed in finding, expressing, and confirming consensus. And in answering the 52 questions, the convention created the framework for an independence constitution. In stage five, a select committee of the House of Assembly endorsed the framework with minor changes. And then in stage six, after a general election, a new government formally put the main features of the proposed constitution to the assembly, and the assembly used a staged legislative process that had been stipulated by the constitutional convention. So that between the first and second readings, the proposals for the constitution were taken back to the several islands for consideration prior to their approval in the House of Assembly. Now the Constitutional Convention, its authority in the whole process was illustrated in an exchange at the London Independence Conference. <coughs> A senior FCO official cast doubt on the merit of term limits for the president and pressed for further consideration. The chief minister replied that this was a carefully considered and unanimous decision of the Constitutional Convention and even if he didn't agree with it, he did not have the authority to change a fully considered decision of the Convention. So question three, within the Gilbert Islands, there was wide public education and involvement in the process of constitutional development, ran in parallel with the conventional transitional steps uh, authorized from London and common to other British dependencies. Two questions remain, both about the Westminster model. I comment solely on the basis of what was considered in the Convention. The spirit in the Convention illustrated David Hume's maxim that humans have knowledge only of things they directly experience. What many had directly experienced was first the colony's government and second the working of government under the constitution of Nauru, a book about which Simon has just spoken. Many had labored in Nauru, and hence their experience. Now I give two examples, again taking the office of president and political parties. Term limits for the president and devices for removing the president from office might be described as President Hamada Roberts' bequest to the Gilbert Islands. <laughs> Stories were told about President de Robert, and prompting much mirth. The moral was, it is a just political maxim that every man must be supposed a knave, to use Hume's words. <laughs> a distrust of political parties. This arose from Gilbertese experience. They inherited from the Christian missions two denominations <coughs> whose conflicts had extended to religious wars. This inspired fear of how those denominations might, and again Hume's words are apt, subvert government, render laws impotent, and beget the fiercest animosities among men of the same nation. The Gilbertese did not look to constitutional models. 
they sought to answer questions. And they grounded their answers in Gilbertese culture and experience. Now I've addressed five questions but in a very quick and schematic way and I've left much unaddressed. You may be perplexed that I've made no mention of Barnaba, the westernmost island in the colony where phosphate had been mined since 1900, nor the Barnabans, most of whom had been resettled on Ramby Island in Fiji. Among Barnaban ambitions were the linked ones of separating the island of Barnaba from the Gilbert Islands colony and laying hands on the Gilbert Islands Sovereign Wealth Fund, which was derived from royalties on phosphate paid in lieu of tax. I don't question the ramifying effects of matters relating to the Barnabans, but they are marginal to the questions we were asked. They would be directly relevant to a different question. What treaty provisions did the UK government introduce into the independence constitution and with what effect? I can comment further, obviously, if you want. For those of you familiar with the academic literature, there'll be another puzzle. The principal academic expositor of constitution making in the Pacific, Professor Yash Gai, makes three claims about constitutional development in the Gilberts. Namely, that the British laid down the procedure for constitution making, dictated the timetable, and excluded local participation. I simply cannot read the evidence that allows those claims. The development of the independence constitution has to be tra traced not in the succession of orders of the British Privy Council that prescribed steps in a largely standardized transitional process. No, that development has to be traced in the quite separate process conducted within the Gilberts. The time given to public education and deliberation, to the Constitutional Convention, subsequent assembly proceedings, and so on. Here was the process which gave to the Gilbertese a constitution of which they had ownership. A leading Gilbertese wrote at the time, the ways the Kiribati constitution was settled reflect a strong Gilbertese influence, and the new constitution provides the Gilbertese people with the opportunity to really feel as if they are participating in their government, which is, after all, a very traditional aspect of Gilbertese culture. The point was restated two years ago. To mark 30 years of independence, the Republic of Kiribati made an Ikiribati Award. I quote from the citation. To honor the contribution made to facilitating the design, the contribution made to facilitating the design of the unique political system that has served the nation since 1979. The political stability of Kiribati since independence confirms the foresight, wisdom, and commitment to the nation of the penultimate governor of the Gilbert Islands, John Smith. Thank you to all four of our contributors. They've come in exactly on time. Now, I would like to start the question. Please may I remind you to say who you are before you ask the question of our team. Can I see your hand? Yes. Uh, I'm going to tell something. 
Lady Lady Peter Pettengold, former British, uh, former governor of the British Virgin Islands, and British High Commissioner of Sierra Leone. Um, what, what I find interesting about the discussion is that essentially the LOL steam panel talk in terms of the Westminster Law as a form of administration, um, and rightly so, because that's what it was. Um, as, as being a Having been the governor, I mean, one aspect that I was always constantly aware of in terms of the Westminster model was the, the political dimension that we were trying to achieve. And, and one of the problems that we did, is we had, I think, in all the territories, in all the countries, was this concept we had in Britain that the Westminster model provides a strong opposition and accountable um, system within the parliament with all these backbenchers and you know, holding their front bench to account and so on. And that has been extremely difficult to achieve, particularly in the smaller territories. And Tom in particular mentioned uh, about Cayman, and we had that in the British Virgin Islands. I mean, again, we had a similar system, only 13 seats, um, which meant, of course, if you got seven, then you won the election, and you had four ministers. So uh, you know, everybody practically became a minister. And in fact, in our system, because the three who didn't get ministerial positions, they created parliamentary under secretary so everybody was on the front bench. <laughs> um, so in that way, you had no accountability from that side. Um, but again, because of the size, I mean, the population of BVI was 14,000, but only 7,000 were BVI members. Of those 7,000, only three to 4,000 were eligible to vote. So your constituencies were very small. And we had to try and overcome this problem because we are having these problems of people crossing the floor and disrupting the government. And we introduced the system there, the at large system. Um, this was something that Walter Wallace, talking to her and I, concocted that we wanted to increase the size of the, the uh, parliament, um, but we couldn't increase the size of the constituencies, otherwise it would have been virtually one family against another family. And so what we did, we introduced a system of adding four extra seats and these were not based on constituencies, but on the territory as a whole. So, so you had your sort of 13 sort of constituencies, and then you had, and then you voted for one of or four at large representatives. It only made an extra 17, but it didn't actually make a fair difference. It meant that we did suddenly have a backbench on the, on the government side, and we had a bit more of a sort of a, an opposition and so on. And that process has continued. I mean, interestingly, I was talking to the BBI government representative just the other night about how he felt the system had come. He felt, yes, it had been an improvement. However, um, in a curious way, he said, the trouble is those are large representatives. They don't really know who they're representing. Whereas at least with the constituency, which is so much based on the Westminster model, we um, used to know who our MP is. But, but it is a system, but it, as I say, yeah, my, my main point about this is, is that you know, the, the Westminster model theoretically is supposed to create this opposition, it's supposed to create this accountable government, and that's where it's been very difficult. It's interesting, isn't it? The theme of a loyal opposition, <coughs> a very strange concept that the Brits have developed. Perhaps that's the hardest thing of all Trump's part, it's not enough to keep it here. <laughs> when they get particularly vile with each other. Another question, and we'll come back to everybody. Can, can I make a procedural point? You just had a very interesting little contribution from the floor. It's not being recorded. Ah, well, the sound will be recorded. The sound will be there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yes. Thank you. People talk loudly. <laughs> Put on your um, legislative assembly voices. <laughs> Was local pre-colonial? So, just in here. Turn I just wanted to find out if pre-colonial traditional systems were taken into account and incorporated into the Westminster model of constitution of democracy and the constitutional drafting. Or did you just sort of, were they just thrown aside and because of being primitive perhaps and um, just the Westminster model and the British way come up with? Thank you. We'll take one more question and then I'll ask the panel to 
comment. Yes, but uh, Derek Smith, Colonial Office and Overseas Development. Um, I served twice in the Caribbean, but as part of a UK aid organisation. So um, I observed rather than took part in constitutional matters. Um, I think that the problems that our contributor mentioned about the Virgin Islands probably didn't apply to the same extent to the larger Caribbean islands. And I think that as Professor Murphy inferred, the Westminster model did work there. And I think the main reason for that was that there is really no established indigenous population in the Caribbean, the small pocket of Caribs in Dominica, which is not of any large size, and therefore all the therefore there's no sort of established cultural and power system such as under, for example, the tribal system in Africa, and therefore all the cultural and political systems were in fact um, imported from the United Kingdom. And then we developed um, democracy gradually through, as Mr. Russell mentioned, the Legislative and Executive Council leading on to um, the House of Representatives and Cabinet Government. And there were in the bigger islands two large political parties who competed against each other. And first past the post, I guess, probably worked in that sort of situation. Um, they sometimes elected populists rather than <coughs> administrators, although some might say that that sometimes happens in the UK too. Um, but, but it did work. Um, and I think that an essential feature in all that was that it was underpinned by well-educated and efficient civil service. In fact, the population as a whole, of course, in the Caribbean was very well educated. Thank I can you. see two more hands, then we'll have a round robin and catch up. Yes, Patrick. Um, Patrick Walker, I'm in Uganda. Um, one point that has, wasn't covered in the talk was the question of law and order and the balance between, say, police and military, so far as there is. Was this a problem? If it wasn't, well, just say no. Um, but if there was, it was addressed, how was it addressed? <laughs> Yes, I think we'll get two more, we'll forget what the questions are here again. John Wilson, I was Attorney General in Tuvalu at Independence, had the privilege of swearing in the Governor General because we didn't want to bring over a judge from the Solomon Islands, so I was the only lawyer to lawyer. <coughs> uh, I just wanted to say, that, taking us back to the Pacific, uh, that Tuvalu had a full Westminster system. We didn't <coughs> have the, the variations that, uh, that, that Kiribati had, and it has worked very successfully. Uh, although there have been crossings of the floor and uh, occasionally there have been votes of no confidence. But it has produced stable government until very recently they had their fir very first uh, uh, declaration of emergen public emergency because of someone objecting to uh, uh, the Island Council telling them how to vote and so on. And Gordon Ward has just gone over there as Chief Justice from Turks and Caicos to Tuvalu uh, to sort that out. So I wanted to make the comment that the, the, that the Westminster system, the pure version, so to speak, can work in small islands. Uh, the lady who asked whether any local traditions were taken on board, uh, not in the constitution making, that was more in the local government, in, church, in, 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 in the church government, in the way that the politicians emerged was through local traditional uh, means. But I did want to ask the question, what is the Westminster model? I mean, is the Nauru version <laughs> still the Westminster model? If you have an executive president and if you have uh, a power of recall, if you have limited terms, uh, okay, the MPs in his cabinet are, uh, his cabinet is a beat, so to that extent it's not the American model. But it would be quite a long way from the Westminster model. I just wondered if the panelists would like to comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We might leave the question of what is the Westminster model right at the end, as it loses concept, <laughs> might suddenly be apparent by tea time. <laughs> 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 well, yes. okay. uh, never lived <coughs> in Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, an NGO, <coughs> but um, formerly of a colony, and uh, I have found this uh, panel very instructive. To Can you tell us which colony? Uh, Guyana, Trinidad, yeah. Okay. And we'd like to thank them. <coughs> Initially, the comment was made about the, um, the Westminster model um, at work, and it struck me that every imperial uh, country thinks that it, its model has worked. The French think that their model has worked in the Caribbean. The Dutch, etc. And um, 
In the Caribbean, one can look at another island. That island might be French. But there, the habits are completely different, even though the people ethnically are the same. They, they have um, five newspapers in the morning, rather than a more limited number. They have five political parties. They think multi-party is the way to go and cannot conceive of basically a two-party system, etc., etc. In fact, it was so extreme, I remember my first visit to French Island, to realize that the French papers were there early in the morning because they were flown in overnight. So the French think their system works. And so we, we, that, that's the first point that I want to make. And within places like the Caribbean where uh, there was no indigenous culture to those territories, we, we were all being migrants. Um, then they all assumed that that is the system. And so I was particularly pleased to hear the story of the Arcadas, because it has always surprised me that the one imperial power that had had the experience of the United States of America, of a colonial uh, society sitting down and deciding what its future would look like, what ought to be its constitution, that somehow that had never dribbled out. And, on the, uh, and I'm so welcome to hear the case of Kiribati, which you have that process of constitution making uh, happening on the ground. Even in India, there has not been a story a look at the society before they start. Thank you. Well, there's a lot there. Not to start. I think, but... No, no. Gregor's no, comments on Peter Temple's talking about political parties, and it's in my paper, but I can spell it out. In 1974, a South African businessman bought the largest <coughs> business in the Solomons and Company, which the government had to buy had to buy him out. He saw the out of the party, created his own Labour Party and ran politics. And the, the situation took five years to, 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 to calm down because it was clear to everyone, and certainly in London, that the island was too small to have two parties. They were going to fight each other continuously. Um, I just don't think that you can have parties in really small states, especially perhaps if they're very remote. What will happen if St. Lena gets its airport and a large number of foreign workers are allowed to non St. Lena workers? Um, come in and the ethnic homogeneity, social homogeneity is, is reduced, uh, is really a matter of some concern. This, this profound ethnic homogeneity, cultural identity, which the share of the Gilberties, seems to me extremely important to protect. And the, the, the party system isn't something you want in that situation. Could you perhaps all talk about the local inputs? Yes, can we? And then we could get on to the law and order, Patrick's question. Two things. I quickly picked up the word you used, primitive. I quickly learned that that was a primitive situation. <coughs> Please don't assume primitive. So you hear a bit of a Can't hear. Can you speak a bit? Because I'm being very critical. <laughs> I picked up on the word primitive. It, it, it just was not primitive. Uh, we were learning totally that much, uh, all the time. Uh, and the other thing was, Kilabas can be praised, but it had one great advantage. It was uniformly and ethnically the same. Most of the current <coughs> examples were not. So they got it right, because it was easier to get it right. They might not like that. But for the rest, the rest of the Pacific, uh, the, the tremendous variety which makes it so wonderful, makes it jolly hard to run it. Um, and education, we went into independence with a dozen graduates. <clears throat> Too much was placed on professionals dictating what was necessary to be an effective administrator, forester. Back to the point again, 
The locals really knew how the things worked. You ask the fishermen, you ask the gardeners in the hills, they knew. So the Westminster system worked because they were comfortable with it, they accepted it in a very, very diverse situation. And they went and they had stayed famous. And somebody asked the question about the military. We all knew we'd have trouble, so we didn't need military. But the police mutinied. <laughs> so that brought, <coughs> and it was back to the diversity. The commanding officers were not obeyed because the, the cultural situation was people would not obey, subordinates would not obey because of the divisions. The Westminster system held it together, plus the legal system and the judicial system. All the weeks, all the procedures, the standing orders, it was a great legacy and we should be very proud of it. Now, not many people will be too pleased to hear that, but that's the situation that applies in reality and primitive. No. So is that, did you actually incorporate the local advanced? Yeah, the cultural yeah. constitution. But they quickly said, oh, no. Uh, they considered it then. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And I said, didn't I say it divided us? It just made it worse. <coughs> More thoughts on law and order military, please. Uh, one of the points in the history of the latter years of the Gilbert Islands was the issue of a defence force. Gilbert Islands has a strategically crucial position in the Central Pacific. And uh, with the departure of the British, it was the question of where, what would happen in the Gilbert Islands. And uh, Australia made available the support and funds for a defense force. In early 1976, with the first army lorries trundling along the, the bank, which is basically what Tarawa is, the bank between the sea and the, and the lagoon. And you can imagine the three and five ton lorries going along a single track road between uh, the little islets that make up the, the land. Uh, there, it was a pretty aggressive in, uh, uh, symbol of power. And the chief minister, faced with union trouble in uh, Basio, which is the port island, as it were, uh, the chief minister threatened to use the defence force. The defence force then became a major issue in the development of political <coughs> thinking in the Gilbert Islands. And you will see in that short note that I've given, one section called Unusual Provision. It stipulates what disciplined forces are allowed police, and so on, and through its exclusion, no defense force is allowed unless there is a constitutional amendment. Because one of the first things that happened was that the defense force, this is before independence, the defense force was sent packing. Now, that was an awareness, and they were made aware of it, in the Gilbert Islands by the symbol of those military vehicles. Uh, it is an unusual provision and Gilbert, Solomon Islands may well have been aware of the same, 
the, the same issue. Now, if I pick up the, your, your point about the culture, uh, culture in the Gilbert Islands, one of the most crucial part of Gilbertese, features of Gilbertese culture, is a commitment to equality. Absolute idea that everybody must have their chance. E equality. And you'll see that, you know, it, there are various places in which they built this into the Constitution. Or at least into the electoral laws, for example. There's no such thing as having to pay a high deposit to become uh, a candidate. Everybody must have their chance. So you have a two-stage electoral process because every family will put up a candidate at the first stage. And before they went for a two-stage electoral process, you were getting people being elected with less than 20% of the electorate supporting that candidate. And there was a sense that they did not command support. So they went for a two-stage electoral process. Two-stage meant that you narrowed it down, but they didn't want it narrowed it down to two, a choice of two, because that would mean that you would have one from each denomination, or you could have one from each denomination, which would then create that tension between that they feared in the development of politics. So there were three candidates required at the second stage where somebody didn't get the majority at the first stage. There are just little indications here of how. I spoke about the Maniaba uh, as, the, as the meeting place. Now, Maniaba culture was a very important part. And one of the things that struck me in that constitutional convention was they never decided anything with a vote. Voting was not regarded as, as part of Maniaba behavior. They did actually use voting on one or two occasions when a thing went on and on and on, and the chairman used it as a way of conveying how much support there was to the people who were riding their hobby horse, as it were. But it at no point was used to decide it. He had, he, they would have a vote, and then they would say to the people, are you now content? And if they said, no, they're still unhappy, they went on discussing it. And then they would have another vote. And then the volume of clapping was a second important part of the working of the procedure. If there was good clapping, in the end, the people said, yes, we agree. But that was the crucial thing. It had to be by consensus. I'm sorry. Tom, would you like to, uh, thank you. Would you like to comment? I'd, I'd like to comment on the difference between Kiribati and the other Pacific Islands. Yes. Kiribati has one language and the culture with small island variations is one culture. The Solomon Islands has more than 80 languages. My most grandiloquent title when I was in the Solomons was Chairman of the Pigeon English Examination Board. <laughs> um, the, the, the thing is, Pigeon English does have a, a unifying um, influence, not only in the Solomons. I've taught Pigeon English in the Solomon Islands, in New Caledonian and New Hebrides, with some French variations. I've taught it in Papua New Guinea. So it has a, a, a unifying influence of two <coughs> Pacific and one country can talk to another with, with some, some qualifications. But um, the system used in Kiribati for the American Constitution would have been very, very difficult yes. in the Solomons. When I was chairman of the Select Committee, which turned, we recommend what turned out to be the pre-independence constitution, uh, 74, when I left, uh, I thought there was 10, 12 years to go to independence. They were independent by 1978. And um, in, in the select committee, what all we could do was go out to all the constituencies 
all public meetings. But um, what struck me when the Independence Constitution was promulgated with Solomons, it started off with the preamble. And it said, this is a unified country. And that, that was plain wrong. <laughs> uh, as, as it's turned out, um, the, you, you can draw a map around the country and say this is a country, but in the Solomon Islands you had uh, uh, German colonies in, in the north, from, coming from Bougainville down to the Shortlands and, and Choiseul. And um, in a relatively short span of time, um, they were they went from colonialism to independence. And it, as it's turned out, the, uh, the, world, the, the country was not cohesive enough as, as uh, Kiribati was. Uh, the adherence to a common language and common customs. So I, I, I think very creditable John Smith and the own um, putting together this constitution. I don't think it would necessarily work in territories um, like Papua New Guinea, for example, or, or the New Hebrides, or, or the mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Well, I've, um, I'm very taken by the notion of consensus through clapping, and I'm going to ask you now to, <laughs> <laughs> to give a prime exhibition of that, to show your gratitude to our speakers for this terrific first session. Mm -hmm.